Okay. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us, joining us tonight for this Parent Town Hall meeting. My name is Jeff Gray and it's my privilege to serve as the Senior Vice President for Student Affairs. Uh, it's also my distinct privilege and honor to be able to call myself a Fordham parent. Uh, three of my daughters attended Fordham, uh, all as undergraduates and went on to graduate school. They're all out and gainfully employed now. So I have that perspective to bring to the table uh, every day when I work with your sons and daughters. Uh, I am pleased to have with me tonight, Fordham's 33rd president, Tanya Tetlow. Before I turn it over to President Tetlow for some initial remarks, I would like to remind you to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom window to submit questions to us. We have a team of my colleagues with us tonight from student affairs, residential life, dining services, health services, financial aid, public safety, academics, disability services, career services, and IT, all in the background, who will be typing answers to your questions, especially specific questions that you may have for those areas. While we may not be able to answer every question tonight, we hope to be able to answer as many as possible. I will also be asking President Tetlow several broader questions that were submitted in advance and some from the Q&A feature. President Tetlow, I'll turn it over to you now for a few brief remarks before we go into questions. Well, hello all. Um, thank you for doing this and for being here. I have gotten to engage with a lot of the parents of incoming students when you drop them off at orientation. And I wanna apologize for asking so many of you how you were doing. And then when you were holding it together until that moment, and then you burst into tears because I asked, I apologize for that. I've learned my lesson not to disrupt your hard fought sort of composure at those moments. Um, I'm hoping to be a Fordham parent soon. I have a 17 year old stepson who's applying. He just has to decide whether he thinks it will be too weird that a stepmother has this job or whether he can hide in the shadows and just not tell anybody because we have different last names. And then I have a 10 year old daughter, Lucy, who may, may or may not interrupt this webinar to demand a snack, but who promises that she will never leave me and will come to Fordham and hold my hand in my office and then go off to class and remind all the professors who her mommy is. So we'll see how that works out for me. But um, I'm so glad to join you here. Um, I arrived in July. I was before that president of Loyola New Orleans, which I loved. Um, and I grew up in New Orleans, um, but I am I exist because of Fordham. My parents met here. Uh, my mom was in grad school. My dad was getting his PhD. And many of you know the story, but uh, the unusual background that I have that my dad was a Jesuit. And once he met, my mom had the agonizing decision to make of whether he the call he felt to have a family and to raise us well um, was uh, worth leaving the priesthood that he loved. So I said in my inauguration speech, I like to think he made the right decision for selfish reasons, but I also tried to make it up to the Jesuits. So I'm so glad to be here. And I come deeply rooted in issues really important to the world of running a university from having been a prosecutor and thinking about criminal justice and safety of having run a domestic violence legal clinic and thinking about um, Title IX issues, um, of having written about race and criminal justice and thinking about diversity writ large. Uh, and then all the work at, when I was chief of staff of Tulane and then president of Loyola of running a university. And so I am thrilled to be at Fordham, which has been such a big part of my family's life, the incredible academic excellence that it offers of the faculty who both do groundbreaking research, but also are in love with your students and love teaching them, of the kind of community that we create across two campuses and the complexity that that is. But I um, am getting to know your students. And when I hear from them, so much it makes me want to grill them and make sure it's true is how much they adore being here. And so we are at necessarily in perfect community, always striving to be better. And we really appreciate your help and, and feedback and, and making those decisions to sort of improve things and tweak and, and constantly look for ways to do better. But I am really thrilled at what I'm walking into and the quality of the student community we have, of the ways that they come from all over, that they are so different from each other, but have so much in common. And what I found thus far is 
a community that's really um, values driven, where students are trying to find ways to um, to seek answers, to find their vocation in life, not just their career, not just their profession, but what they want to do of what will motivate them in the world. Um, and that they treat each other with such respect that we've taught them and want to model for them the willingness to be challenged that when they, they try to find the answers, it's not with self-righteousness, it's with um, real humility about being willing to be wrong, being willing to be challenged, to look for the truth, to look for the right answers. So I love it here. Um, I love our two very different campuses, and we will constantly try to engage students and support them well within the very different frameworks of the two campuses we have. Um, I, in some ways, want to connect them and merge those communities. In other ways, I appreciate how different they are in the, in the strengths and the opportunities they bring our students. So I hope you will urge them to go back and forth um, to really make use of both campuses because they are stunning in such different ways. Uh, and to make use of New York, of uh, the place where we are, of the opportunities it creates, the internships, the service learning, the chances to just be at the center of so much. So um, I will stop there and ask for your questions. Okay, first question out of the gates. In your first few months at Fordham, can you give an assessment of where Fordham is right now and where you see it going? Well, um, it's it's a remarkable institution. It is um, elite and excellent and driven by the centuries of credibility of Jesuits and how they created higher ed as we know it in Europe and beyond. Um, so we want to keep growing in that, investing in our research function and the ways we have impact on the world. Uh, and it is a really remarkable place to entrust with your children. I keep meeting uh, really young alumni who have such grief and mourning for the fact that they graduated and had to leave campus. It's really <laughs> remarkable how often I hear that. And so that that special nature of the community, which if we had to create from scratch, we would struggle to do, but our job is to um, protect it, to improve it, to always strive to do better, but to really understand what, what makes that magic that I hear from so many of you as parents that really matters. Um, I want us to continue to grow a national stature to have the world know more about us and to tell our story constantly better to lift our profile, um, but really to double down on who we are on our Jesuit mission on our impact on the world of the ways that we teach and inspire students, including many of you who are probably alumni who have sent your children to us as well. Okay, thank you. Next question. Uh, many parents are upset about the vaccine mandate rather than giving students their own choice. Can you please elaborate on the vaccine mandate and your decision-making process? What has driven Fordham to mandate this versus recommend it? Sure. Um, so Fordham, uh, from the beginning of uh, the development on such a remarkable schedule of the vaccines and the protection that they provided, along with much of uh, many of their peers require the vaccine as such and and always took a stance on wanting those uh, the vaccinations to be up to date per the CDC's guidelines of really sticking to the CDC as authority in that way. Uh, the reason I didn't shift that requirement is uh, a lot of things. You know, we um, want to protect a student body that lives most of them in very close quarters, which is why universities have almost always had vaccine requirements for measles to meningitis. You know, that is our normal state of affairs because we live closely together, that your students are many of them young and healthy and at lower risk, but not all of them. And I hear from parents who are um, the parents of the immunocompromised of, you know, teenagers who beat cancer and now are quite vulnerable and how grateful they are that we do our best to um, really protect the most vulnerable among us. That and the faculty and staff who serve your students are older, are more collectively vulnerable as well. So um, they are very grateful to you. And But in doing this, what we're trying to do is to remind everyone of this common mission that we are we are risk averse, but with the, the idea that we're really trying to protect the most vulnerable among us and that we do that um, 
not to override those of your students who feel very strongly about this. And so we do urge those who do, who are worried about the health impact of the vaccine on themselves, um, who have a religious objection to the vaccine to file for an exception. We are um, granting many of those exceptions because we're not trying to override those of you who, who have very strong um, opinions about this. But what we are trying to do is battle with inertia of, of so many of the students who tell us they fully intend to get the vaccine, they just might forget if we don't give them a deadline. So we give them that choice. Here's a deadline to make a reasoned decision, either really articulate for us why you need to opt out or go ahead and get the shot, but don't do nothing because you just don't remember, right? Because the stakes are still too high. We're worried about the impact of long COVID, which is still indeterminate and, and not looking good for a lot of folks who've gone through it. Um, and we're worried about the fact that this is not over, right? It's better. And we pray and hope that it will continue to decline to be more like the flu to be endemic. Um, but that world where the vaccines have done wonders for Fordham and being able to function of recapturing so much of what we lost with the shutdown of being together in person and residential life uh, in the classroom that, you know, when rates are low, we don't have to have the mask, we can teach your students and see their faces. And, you know, if, if need be, we'll go back to that. If things get terrible, we're waiting on the possibility of a winter surge, hoping it doesn't happen. Um, and, and hoping that, you know, while institutions are making different decisions and Notre Dame just announced this week, they're also requiring the booster of, of students, um, that we just do our best to navigate this as well as we can. So none of this is easy. And I tell you with great humility, how hard we try to get it right to consult with medical experts to make the right decisions, but we will forever be data driven. And as situations change, continue to look at the data and we really do appreciate your input. Uh, related to that, and you alluded to this in, in your response, why are no exemptions being granted for parents to visit students on campus? Um, we are now with our visitor policy, um, if you tell us that you have a religious or medical reason you can't be vaccinated, you are welcome on campus. So, so know that please. Um, and I also see a question about um, a, a parent whose son had the vaccine more recently and doesn't and wants to know why he has to take the booster so soon. We have an automatic system um, where if you've had another booster or if you've had COVID recently and the medical recommendation really is to then wait, that you just check a box and let us know that and circle back and do it when, when it's time. Yeah, we have over 600 students that have a temporary exemption because right. so uh, right. at this moment. So, okay, switching gears. Uh, what is your take on affirmative action since cases have just been argued before the Supreme Court? All right, you're giving me all the easy ones here. Um, I used to teach about constitutional law and race, so I can do an entire semester's worth of lectures on the subject, but I will spare you. Um, I think that, uh, you know, for a court that, you know, a lot of uh, members of the court who believe strongly that the way to end racism is to stop talking about it, to ignore it. I disagree on that. And I won't bore you with the constitutional reasons I disagree with that, but um, part of them in terms of the original intent of the 14th Amendment and, and how it was treated at the time. But I will tell you from a practical matter in higher ed, you know, this world where we thought we could line up the 40,000 applicants to Fordham in order of their deserving to be here. We've just understand that life is more complicated than that. With COVID, so much of um, higher ed went test optional because we all finally collectively admitted that those tests used to be somewhat a good measure when we were taking them and we went in there cold or maybe looked at a book twice before we took the test. But now there's so much of a billion dollar industry in test preparation that they tend to measure more the amount of private tutoring you've gotten for the test more than they do actual ability that we look to grades in high school, but we're comparing apples to oranges in the um, competitiveness of the schools, all of that. And so what we do is a holistic review. We're looking for character and grit. We're looking for um, the, the idea that someone's overcome obstacles, including 
growing up in rural poverty or having a death in the family or overcoming racism and all the quantifiable ways we know that racism is still a very real obstacle in this country. And so to us, that shows both uh, someone's, someone's character and um, hard work and ability and grit. It also, we look to trying to create a full picture of the student body of having a student body that is has variety such that the students learn as much from each other as they do from us. So that's why we want as many of the 50 states as we can, not because we have any ideas what somebody from Iowa believes, but because that variety matters to us. And so we are very proud at Fordham to have a student body that's pretty close to the diversity of this generation of young people. And it helps our our students find their 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 folks, but also reach out across that difference of learn from someone who's just grown up in a very different environment than they have. And all of that matters to us. So the Catholic schools filed an amicus brief from Notre Dame to Fordham in Georgetown, asking the court to remember that we also have religious freedom reasons that we should be able to express our values and in, in how we do admissions and, and what we teach on the subject of racism. Um, and the uh, military academy similarly expressed their desperate desire to look for talent writ large to um, and to um, be able to identify it and, and not to be, you know, limited to things like standardized tests and doing that. Corporate America, a lot of companies filed the same sorts of briefs. So we'll see. Um, I think the court's leaning towards striking it down and forbidding us from considering race. Uh, we can consider anything else, but just not that. Um, and, uh, you know, it's it's going to be, a, a, I think, a tough blow for many reasons. But I, I've spoken out about this. Otherwise, you can see what I think. Um, but it's going to be an interesting time. Thank you. Okay, next question. What do you view as the biggest challenges coming in as the president of Fordham University? Well, they're all the things that um, keep all of us in higher ed up at night, you know, worrying about our students, of, of doing everything we can to keep them safe, of helping them become adults and make their choices, but also wanting to protect them from those choices sometimes. Um, we worry about... Um, being able to have active civic engagement on our campuses when sometimes there's a decreased appetite for people being challenged sort of from both sides. And so really protecting that inquiry, that um, seeking of truth, of intellectual humility. Um, we worry about the affordability of college and how expensive it is for us to provide real excellence to your students and how conscious we are of how more of a reach it is to afford that excellence. So bridging that gap is a core principle of what we do and is really very difficult. So we continue to urge Congress to keep up with inflation with Pell Grants, for example, of, of making sure that we make higher ed affordable because in order to be globally competitive in the world, American students need to be really well educated that we need to invest in them. Um, so all of those things. Uh, but it's also a wonderful job because your students make it wonderful. And I spent time with student leaders at Lincoln Center yesterday, and they were such a delight and just sort of filled up my tank <laughs> so well because um, their earnestness and their passion and their commitment to constantly making Fordham better was really wonderful. Okay, thank you. Next question. Everything at Fordham has been wonderful except the food. <laughs> Is there any hope that Fordham will be improving food services, including more healthy options? So we got a lot of questions in writing, too, about this. So I, I very much hear you. Um, I was reading the history of Fordham before I began, and the complaints about the food go back to 1841. Uh, my favorite story was about how the students were complaining they were fed potatoes covered with molasses in the 1850s, and, and they were very tired of that. Um, we it's a constant battle to do well by this and to make sure your students are well fed that the food options they get are healthy and encourage them to make healthy choices that we deal with navigate the variety of their 
taste of how to keep it varied when they're eating there every day, of how to um, make sure that we're covering allergies, um, religious obligations of all of that, and then have variety within those options as well. It is not easy. And um, universities tend to use a few contractors who do this work well. Um, so trading horses only matters so much. Uh, but it is also possible that we can forever light a fire under them and remind them to try harder, to be more creative, to be more thoughtful in the skill with which they cook. And so as someone from New Orleans who takes food very seriously, um, I am going to sit down and have those talks with them. But we do keep a lot of data and feedback. And most of it is positive, actually, from your students, right? It's just very hard to please everyone all the time. So we are going to keep trying and constantly ask um, Aramark to do better and um, to hold them accountable in that way. Uh, but just know that that work is ongoing. And so the feedback helps us make sure we're not missing anyone or anything. Um, but as you know, from when some of your students were at home as the adolescents making demands on you, it is, it is not easy <laughs> to get it right for everyone all the time. So we will keep trying harder. Thank you. Next question. <clears throat> Can you speak about the safety and security you are providing to our students who live both on and off campus? Are you concerned about the rise in crime in New York and in the neighborhoods around the campuses? Absolutely. Um, you know, we're seeing a rise in crime in New York and really across the country, particularly in cities. Uh, there are times that it would be much easier for me to lead a university in, in a rural place where we could just put walls around it and only deal with the crime that students commit against each other. Um, but, you know, cities are tough to navigate. So we do an awful lot here. And I've been digging in as someone who was in law enforcement for a while, really asking lots of detailed questions about the quality of what we do. And I've been very impressed. So we have a campus security force, uh, much of which were uh, are folks who were NYPD officers. They have very close relationships with the force, with local precincts, forever looking at data and trends and, and keeping us on guard in that way. Um, we are lucky in that we have two campuses that are, um, you know, where we can restrict access on and off. And, and we worry about that from a community relations and, and how to stay open um, in, in many ways. But what it does allow us to do is to sort of know um, uh, to be able to restrict sort of what happens on our campus in terms of um, keeping it to, to our own students and, and folks who work here and having it be well lit with cameras and really uh, eliminate much of anything happening on our campuses. But our students need to navigate New York. They need to learn how to do that. And so we both think about walkways to and from Arthur Avenue. We have shuttle services. We have apps that you can text for help immediately and get someone to you as quickly as possible. We, in our off-campus housing that we ourselves own or rent. We have security station there all night long. Um, we've done a lot to do as much as we can uh, to keep our students safe and to really remind them of how you navigate a big city, of how you evaluate risk. And, and you all can help us reinforce those messages to the extent that they're willing to listen to you uh, harp on them about that safety. But of, of teaching them not to be afraid of the world constantly and, and not to certainly not to be afraid of the amazing neighborhoods in which we are located, but to be aware of risk and to think through carefully how to be responsible, um, aware of their circumstances, uh, not be alone um, and, and conscious of sort of timing and, and what they're doing. So we'll keep reiterating those messages to them and keep a close eye on everything that happens. We let you know when things happen near campus. Um, we send out alerts to keep everyone's guard up. Um, but I will tell you that uh, looking at the crime data for New York, everything that goes wrong here gets a lot of attention because we're sort of at the media capital of the world, but the per capita risk of New York is still among the safest in major cities in this country. And I know it doesn't feel that way. And, and it certainly doesn't feel that way to, as a parent when you're worried as I do too. Um, but the risk that anything will happen to any one person here is still very low um, compared to a lot of the other cities, certainly the city that I moved here from. And I will add that I had 
uh, all three of my daughters lived in the off-campus area around the Bronx, and two of them live on the Upper West Side right now in the neighborhood around Fordham. So I would just say from a parental perspective, I would, would echo everything that President Tetlow uh, just said. Yeah. Um, we've had a few questions come in uh, in advance and in the chat about the Catholic nature of the institution. So I'm going to combine a couple of questions here. Um, thank you for guiding and praying for our children. One of the main reasons I sent my daughter to Fordham is because it is a Catholic university. I understand they are young adults and they make their own decisions. However, what efforts does the staff make to develop our children's Catholic faith? What resources are available to develop their Catholic faith on campus? And I greatly appreciate all the support with this. So it's the blessing and the curse of free will, right? They come to college and it's no longer the world of mandatory mass. And, um, uh, and so I will say that something really profound happens if students at this age opt in to their faith, it really has the chance to stick for life. That that ability to choose whether to stray or to come back or whether to opt in even if they haven't been raised in it is something really um, uh, important. And so we have a very fulsome Catholic uh, uh, campus ministry here on both campuses. Um, we do a lot around both the very traditional expressions of faith and trying to draw students in in a way that emphasizes uh, inclusion and welcome and making them feel loved by God above all. Um, we're also very proud of being ecumenical because we have a lot of students who come here because they know that it's okay to be religious here and you don't have to be embarrassed by that, which is sometimes true in an increasingly secular world where people are made to feel silly because they are Muslim or Jewish or devout Christian in some way. And so um, I'm very proud of how inclusive a place this is and continue to plant that flag that you can be your full self here, whether you're religious or not, whether you come to your values from philosophy or psychology or from faith, um, that we care about the person you are. And we very much want you to be able to understand the joyful community and tradition and what it means to do human activity that people have been doing for thousands of years. Um, so so I have uh, been uh, the last couple Sundays joining the student choir up in the choir loft at mass. Um, we do a lot to sort of weave those messages into everything I say of, of encouraging the faculty to understand and reflect that as well in, in how they talk about faith and how they encourage it. Um, and you can keep helping make us better in that because our goal really is that they feel the welcome of the church that we we lean into the ways that they really um, believe in what the church is doing, like Laudato Si, like so many of the messages of the church that kind of can cut through denial and and call people back to values. Um, and I I hope we do it well. Thank you. Uh, moving in a different direction, where is the Gabelli School heading now that Dean Rafficioli has left? Well. Uh, she, I very much hope would stay, but she has been there a very long time and deserved a rest. And so um, we are uh, underway with the search right now. We're actually interviewing three finalists and they're getting to uh, four finalists um, and they're a remarkable group. Um, there's so much interest in the school because it's such a crown jewel of Fordham and just a, a really amazing place. Um, so that's all good news. We have hard decisions to come, but we're getting feedback from groups of students, from faculty, from so many um, who are interviewing the finalists and helping us uh, choose the best person we can to lead the school forward. But it's a really important decision for us because Gabelli is so important to the future of Fordham. Okay, thank you. Um, post pandemic question. How are you thinking about Fordham and the Fordham education post pandemic? What will be returning? What will be forever different? Um, 
You know, it's it's hard to know. I will say that our faculty, like all faculties, learn that they can, in fact, pivot much more quickly than they ever imagined. My favorite moment at Loyola was when my predecessor as president, Father Jim Carter, who was 92 and still teaching physics in the classroom, um, right before the shutdown, showed me that he bought a new camera and new light so that he could teach online and look better <laughs> as he did it and engage the students. And I told the faculty, if Father Carter can do it, we can do it too. Um, um, I think that that kind of jury rigged version of online is not the best, right? But what we needed to do is to get the reminders of what actually works well in online and hybrid, the ability to have the guest speaker from across the globe, the um, engagement with little quizzes with students that we have to find a way to do in person as well. But we also got reminded of how much um, of what we had to give up temporarily really matters to us of living in community of having that engagement with students where they learn as much in the um, hallway of the res hall at two in the morning as they do in the classroom and how they deal with each other and and um, build character in so many ways so um, we are figuring that out um, we have some really great um, faculty who are engaging each other. They even have a podcast where they interview people who have creative, thoughtful ideas of how do we take the best of what we got and, and continue to use it in the classroom. Um, so I think some of that flexibility, uh, that outreach is good for students who have to go home with a broken leg, that we have ways they can maybe continue to dip into the class and not miss so much. Um, but a lot of it was a reminder of why we loved the world before Zoom. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> um, here's one from the group chat. Um, how, given the cancel, the rampant cancel culture across U.S. campuses, will you ensure that Fordham supports active debate and remains inclusive and welcoming of multiple points of view and welcomes all political and ideological beliefs to the forum of debate and discussion among both professors and students? because it's just absolutely essential to what we do, right? The nature of a university is we have to be able to debate. Um, it is, uh, so that will be the message for me forever to students who want to not hear views with which they disagree, to faculty who get a little too adamant in their own ideas uh, in the classroom and need to foster that debate back. I mean, I will say as a law professor, the nature of how we teach is to forever require students, you have to articulate the other side of the argument. Not because we're trying to get you to be morally relativist, but because you can't really know the strength of your beliefs until you can actually state in a meaningful way the other side of the argument. So it's really crucial to me. I am um, been happy with what I found thus far uh, at Fordham of not having those kind of pressures to the extreme that they sometimes exist on other campuses. So fingers crossed, but just know that I will do everything I can in that way. Um, one idea I like um, when I can uh, find a moment to, to make it happen for us is to have good old fashioned debates um, where the person making the argument doesn't necessarily believe the argument, right? Just to teach students that you have to listen to the quality of the argument and not go into personal attacks on the speaker, uh, which is easier to remember when you think the speaker may have just been assigned this point of view and not actually believe it. So um, a lot of work to be done there, um, a growing pressure uh, at, on universities in general, but really core to what we need to teach and to model for our students. Okay, thank you. Um, next question from the, uh, the, group, uh, the group chat. There appears to still be a disconnect between the Rose Hill and Lincoln Center campuses. Do you have any ideas as to how to bring Lincoln Center into more of a sense of belonging with the Rose Hill campus and the overall student experience at Fordham? So I was brainstorming with students at Lincoln Center about this yesterday, and I actually asked them as leaders if they would help me really do some creative thinking about how we do that well. Um, you know, we have the RAM ban, we um, do our best to bridge that gap, and it's two campuses so close and yet so far. Um, and, and just are, are there more creative ways we can do that? I can tell you, we work really hard to even the services available at both, uh, which just feel different when you're in a high rise campus where you get the advantage of everything being compact, the huge advantage of being in the center of everything in terms of opportunities for internships, for uh, 
unbelievable cultural experiences of so much of what it means to be in the center of Manhattan with views from the res halls that we tease them they'll probably never again have in their life. Um, but uh, there are other parts of the Rose Hill campus that spread out gothic beauty, the sporting events, the things we do with the space we have there and not at Lincoln Center that are hard to replicate. Um, we're hurriedly trying to finish the gym. We had some supply chain delays there, which we were sad about, um, but of, of trying to do as much as we can to think through community spaces, um, uh, of all the things that we can do to make that uh, far more compact real estate as engaging as possible of student life. Um, but uh, yeah, it's something I'm sort of obsessed with as a logic problem. How do we do more to bridge that gap and to make Rose Hill students feel comfortable coming to Lincoln Center and engaging with the location and the opportunities of that as well. So if you have ideas, send them to me. Um, but I've literally asked the students, could you have some open-ended, broad brush, inclusive planning on this and tell me what you find. Okay. As parents, we are concerned about the uh, return on investment, especially with the rising cost of education. Can you talk to us a little bit about career services and student outcomes uh, when they get to the end of the college process? Sure. Um, I so impressed by that data. So last year's class hit 90% uh, um, employed or going on to grad school. Um, and of that remainder, they're, you know, kind of divided between students who opted out of the job market for whatever reason and, and the few who are still looking. Um, we're still getting the data from last year's graduating class, but we're already over the 80% hurdle early on in the fall. And then it takes a while for students to tell us what they're doing, right? We're forever bugging them to let us know. So um, make sure they, they do that and stay in touch with us after they graduate. But we have a really robust career services program. Um, and then just the incredible opportunities in New York and beyond of our alumni. We have 200,000 living alumni and boy, are they eager to hire Fordham graduates. Um, I love hearing that from so many of them, partly out of loyalty and affinity, but also because they just have a very strong sense of Fordham students of being um, really smart, a pragmatic of having experience in the world because of how we teach them and of being good people who, who um, are going to be brilliant at the jobs that they do. So we continue to push that and to, to open as many doors as we can. Well, and as a Fordham parent, I will tell you that I have three daughters gainfully employed. One is a lawyer in Manhattan. Uh, one is in the communications industry. She works at Disney. And the third one uh, is an elementary school teacher teaching special education. So they all found different career paths. Internships were important. Um, and they, they parlayed a Fordham liberal arts education into a pretty direct and clear career path. So, um, okay, next question. Uh, our son is a dual citizen hailing from Japan. Is there anything we, his parents, or he can do to encourage more applicants from Japan? Oh, thank you for that. Um, a lot of recruiting in any country is word of mouth. Um, so I think circling back to the the counselors at his high school, if um, if if he went to secondary school in Japan, I shouldn't assume that, um, that of, of helping connect us with um, the institutions there, you know, we, we gravitate to the Jesuit institutions that exist in Japan, but of finding more pathways into telling our story and who we are. Um, when we recruit out in the world, it's very hard to recruit for the entire globe. So we really have to sort of build those relationships one by one. And we're eager to do that. We're at 8% international students right now and eager to grow that. Um, so my stepson grew up in Scotland. Um, so he's applying as an international student and it's giving me a window into how that process works for him. And, and how he navigates the very strange world of, of American colleges. Um, but uh, we love having students from all over the world that adds so much to the experience for everybody. Okay, thank you. Um, as parents, we are acutely aware of the fact that um, over-enrollment creates some strain and stress for our students and families. Um, are you considering expanding residence hall opportunities because there's not enough space? Um, 
and or are you and you are you going to invite more commuters to live on campus? Sure. Um, so we, looking back on the last two classes, um, we we were down a bit during COVID. And so tried to carefully let in more students, but that same year became way more popular, right? Um, and so in ways that were dramatic and unexpected. So it was unintentional to have that big class two years ago. And last year's class, we accepted fewer students um, and, and still ended up higher than we imagined, right? I mean, the problem is that now that people apply to you know, when we were going to college, we often applied to an average of three schools. Now it's an average of about 10. And so predicting which students will say yes once you admit them, it's just gotten harder. Um, and so we we guessed wrong in that way. So we're glad to be popular, but it created real problems of logistics, of moving students into the res halls, of having to make last minute assignments, of figuring it all out in the end. And it was um, an incredible effort by our student affairs staff, but it was also really tough on many of our families. And we're so sorry for that and so grateful for your patience in dealing with that. So we are determined to bring in a smaller class this year. And I've uh, made that very clear. Our projections are lower. We're, we're trying to be risk adverse and not come in too high. Um, and because it's important to us, this guarantee we have of housing on our campus for four years, if students choose that, a lot of them do choose to move off campus for all sorts of reasons um, and have a very great experience with that. Um, but we are, are very much trying to balance um, our numbers to get it right. And we're grateful to you for that. In the long term, yes, I would love to build more res halls. And I should mention on the dining front, um, the second half of the student center uh, renovation on Rose Hill um, is happening. It's going to take us a while, particularly on New York construction standards to get there. So it may not benefit your students um, unless they're very early in their time with us, but we are upgrading our dining facilities there, which will also help. And the dining facilities at Lincoln Center are more modern already than the ones we have at Rose Hill. So yes, um, we it seems like we may need to build and, and welcome more students onto our campus. Um, and we're very grateful to you for your patience <laughs> in the meantime. So uh, fingers crossed, uh, we, we stick the landing and get the size of the class right and don't become even more popular than we expect this year because we really care about your experience of this and doing right by our students. Thank you. In what ways are you using technology to improve the student experience? Well, I'll give you one example I'm really proud of that that uh, predates me, but is launched just now and is amazing. So we now have a new student portal on the students' phones, right? They live and die by these things. And it is um, uh, piloted with first year students, but we're quickly expanding it to the rest. So it has a lot of the services that they need all in one spot in that intuitive way that they navigate the world. And so they can look quickly and know how many classes they need to graduate. They can schedule an appointment with a counselor very easily. They can schedule an appointment with a tutor very easily. That they, they can sign up for student clubs. And we have it all in one spot using Salesforce, which is great tech, um, to help them have that kind of wraparound service. Initially, we thought we need to put it all in one building to make it manifest. But we realized we could put it on their phones and it would be far easier for them to navigate at two in the morning or whenever it is they're thinking about these things and getting them done. So we're really hoping it will help them, support them, help them on the course to graduation and just make their lives easier. Um, we're also finding ways that students can opt in to some of these systems. We'll be reaching out to you about that. We, uh, are, I'm sorry, that parents can opt in. Your student has to approve it by federal law, right? So that you negotiate that with them of how much they can see and what information they wanna share with you. But we're eager to make that available to to you where, the, where they agree. Okay. What's the biggest surprise you've had since arriving as president? Um, oh, it's so hard to answer that. I think just the scale and the excitement of New York has been great. I mean, I got to throw out a first pitch at a Mets game, which is not something I ever imagined doing. It's totally bucket list for me. Um, but if how uh, remarkable a city this is, and I've really fallen in love with the Bronx of uh, the the um, 
the variety of the neighborhood of how the whole world has come there of, you know, having a block of that's like Albania and then another block of Yemen and then um, Arthur Avenue, I just adore. Um, it's been such a treat. And I say that as someone who really loved my city of New Orleans, but to be in a place with this much culture and amazing food and history and um, that is so global uh, has been pretty great. And to see the ways that Porta makes use of that and to grow those ways and to partner ever more is I'm just very excited to do. Okay. Um, let's see here. We're looking through the chat to pull a couple of other ones. Okay. Here's a good one. I'm thankful for your leadership and your unabashed embrace of your faith. It's refreshing. I'm hopeful that the best is yet to come and we will be praying for you and your family. Will there be additional opportunities to connect with you in the future? Absolutely. Um, you help me figure out the best way to do that. This is one place where Zoom is helpful because I can talk to so many of you on time across many time zones and many countries probably as well. Um, but I want to be very available to you. So we'll just keep doing this. Okay. We're uh, getting close to the end of our time here. Let's see if there's some other questions in the uh, Q&A that we can, let me just pull them up. So and I appreciate the, the the very specific questions. That's why we have staff here to answer them because there's so many questions you can ask me that I won't yet know four months into my role, um, but we're eager to answer them. So I hope that we've gotten back to you on many. Okay, here's just a couple of comments. We consider ourselves fortunate to be part of the Fordham family. Another one, I greatly thank you for all you do. My daughter loves Fordham. Um, let's see. See if there's others one here. I have a question about the book, The Power Broker on my shelf about Robert Moses um, and his relationship with Fordham. Uh, it is, he's such an interesting character, right? And and did so much good in the world that also wreaks so much havoc in other ways. Um, Lincoln Center's really been digging into um, the the history of San Juan Hill, of, um, of the beauty of that neighborhood and the, um, of, of finding ways to celebrate it, to live up to it, to acknowledge the history of the neighborhood that was torn up. Um, and so I think that's part of what we need to do is to um, do that work in partnership with Lincoln Center of, of acknowledge the ways that that from gentrification and slow motion to this kind of urban renewal projects that were so popular at that moment um, come at a cost. And um, just to be honest about that. So it's it's a really interesting subject in all sorts of ways. Although I can't say I finished the book because it weighs about 800 pounds, <laughs> but it's brilliant. Okay. Uh, one more question and then we will go to you to wrap up, Tanya. And then uh, we have one more person coming in to, to address the um, the audience here. Um, with the success of the football team this season, are there any plans to raise Fordham's profile via athletics? So uh, I told the basketball team last night that the football team threw down the gauntlet because they were scoring basketball-like scores in every game, over 50 points. And the poor uh, cheer and dance squads have a tradition of doing push-ups for every point we score. And they were absolutely exhausted. Um, it's been really fun to watch the games. And I'm so proud of what the team has done. Um, we have incredible teams and so many sports. And what I love about it is both that it, it builds excitement with the student body, it summons alumni back, it builds community. Um, and also the uh, graduation rates of our student athletes are higher than the population as a whole, that there's so much discipline and character and leadership development and teamwork that our athletes get when they wake up at five in the morning and go swim in the cold pool and um, compete in so many different sports. So uh, we are looking now at how best to navigate the world of college athletics, which is changing 
overnight, right? The name likeness and uh, name image and likeness uh, rules that have shifted the ways that their cases pending on whether uh, athletes have to be treated as employees, all of that um, makes this a really kind of a time of uncertainty. So I want to wait a minute and see how that settles in, but we're looking hard at um, our facilities. We need more locker rooms of just making sure we're doing right by our student athletes. And then think about ways that we, we balance um, how we make athletics a fundamental part of, of treating students as students and engaging them and lifting the profile of the university without sort of falling into the traps that some schools have fallen into in that regard. So um, the men's basketball team is ahead 35-25 right now. Someone just sent me a text. So after this, you can go to watching the end of that game. Okay. How can you help commuters to get more engaged and have interactions with other students? I've been asking a lot of questions about that too and, and was brainstorming with the students last night about that as well. Um, it's it's Part of it is around physical spaces where students feel comfortable spending time when they've got big gaps between classes. Um, we have more of that at Rose Hill than Lincoln Center, understandably, given the space constraints in our you know, compact campus there. Um, so I'm starting to look into whether there might be ways we can do more of that, um, given all the competing demands for space, especially at Lincoln Center. Um, we have uh, lots of engagement with commuter students, but constantly doing as much as we can to make them feel totally part of this community. I spent part of my college time commuting from home as an undergrad, and I know what it feels to the jarring nature of going back to one world and, and wanting to feel fully a part of college in another, and that the, the kinds of programming we do for students who live on campus at night, because we want to engage them and have them have um, a focus of community that isn't about going off campus and, and drinking, but really being part of student life here can make commuter students feel a little left out because it happens late at night. So lots of straddling there. That's where technology and hybrid world can help us as well. Um, and that we can um, just forever try to do better because uh, that ability to afford Fordham because you can live at home and commute is, is what makes it accessible for a whole lot of students. Um, who are uh, many of them like a quarter of our incoming student class, uh, first generation to go to college. And so it is everything to us that they succeed and that they feel fully a part of us. Okay. We are coming up uh, to the end of our time here. So I want to stop for a minute and thank my colleagues who have been answering your questions behind the scenes. Uh, I'd like to uh, turn it over to President Tetlow uh, for any closing remarks. And then we have one final speaker that's going to address you uh, before we uh, bring this webinar to a close. So, President Tatlow. Well, first, I just want to say thank you so much for this and for your level of engagement. I'm looking at the count here. We have 103 questions that were submitted, 60 of them answered by staffers, 43 that we tried to go through ourselves. So if we didn't get to you, that's just because we couldn't, we'd be here for five hours to get to everybody. But um, I hope that we've addressed many of the things you most wanted to hear about. We will keep doing this. Um, and I, I want to be available to you. You can email me at president Fordham.edu too if you have specific things you want to make sure that I know or, or things that that need to be ad addressed for me. Um, but we have an amazing team here um, who are so eager to do right by your students. And one of the things I love about this place is how much they treat um, your children like they were their own children um, with that kind of compassion and care. And so when we do that work of wanting them to become adults, of making choices, protecting them from the worst of those choices, but trying to help them navigate the world and learn how to do that. Um, we love doing it in partnership with you and your understanding and grace as we try um, to help your students really um, build those skills of adulthood, of character, of learning, of so much. And um, we just adore them. So thank you for trusting us with them. Uh, thank you for everything you do to have our back and try to reinforce the messages we're trying to teach them. Thank you for the remarkable people that they are because they are just a delight to teach and to learn with and help us keep trying to do better. 
Um, we, we really will continue to learn, um, to navigate, to tweak, to find where our, despite our best efforts, we've fallen short um, and, and to do right by them. But most of all, we're just so proud of the work that Fordham has done for 181 years and continues to do. So um, thank you for being a part of that. Okay, thank you, President Tetlow. Before we end this webinar, I would like to invite a member of the Parents Leadership Council and the father of two current Fordham students, Kevin McShane, to close with a few words. Kevin? Great. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Hi, everybody. My name is Kevin McShane. My wife, Kate, and I have two children currently attending Fordham University. Jack is our senior and Nora is our sophomore. And our family's from Chicago. President Tetlow, on behalf of the Fordham parent community, Thank you for spending your evening with us and providing your thoughts on topics that we as parents care about. Your energy, your, your love of Fordham, your commitment to Jesuit education has been wonderful and inspiring to us all. And thank you for your transparency and openness to engage all the stakeholders across the university. My wife and I are members of the Fordham Parents Leadership Council for the past two years. If you're not familiar with this council, I'd really encourage anybody interested to learn more about us. Our two children found a home their freshman year at Fordham on Rose Hill. Fordham University quickly for us and our family felt like home away from home. Kate and I wanted to get more involved and help the mission of the university and we found the Parents Leadership Council. It's a great network of community of fellow parents who wanna give back and provide a helping hand to the university where they can. There's a lot of information on the Fordham website if you wanna learn more about the Fordham Parent Leadership Council and I encourage everybody to take a peek at it. So with that, again, thank you, President Tetlow for answering all the questions that are uh, near and dear to our hearts. Thank you for your leadership. And with that, have a great evening, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Pleasure to have you all with us. And we certainly sincerely appreciate uh, your entrusting your children to us. We work with them every day as if they were our own children. Uh, and we are very grateful to have them uh, in our presence and have the opportunity to work with them. So thank you. And with that, we will bring this to a close. Thank you very much. Thank everyone. you, Kevin, for joining us too.